بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So we're beginning part three. So what I'm going to do is I just want to go back for a moment to the table of content contents that the author put together, which is after his preface, and he says about this section that we're about to about this part part three. He says. On what is necessary for the Prophet ﷺ and what is impossible for him, what is permitted for him and what is forbidden for him, and what is valid in those matters which can be ascribed to him. And then he says this, this part is the secret of the book and the core of its fruit. What comes before it lays the foundation and provides the proofs for the clear anecdotes we will relate in it. It governs what follows it and accomplishes the goals of the book. When its promise is put to the test and its duty fulfilled, the breast of the accursed enemy will be constricted and the heart of the believer will shine with certainty and its lights will fill the, his breast. The man of intellect will then value the Prophet ﷺ as he should be valued. So obviously the whole book is important, but this part of the book, as he says himself, this is the, the real heart of the whole matter. And the, the two parts that come before it, part one and part two, and then the fourth part, which comes after it, are like the two wings to this section. So um, for the next several weeks, you know, uh, we're, inshallah, we're going to be discussing this most important part uh, of the book. Okay, so we'll begin, inshallah, with the, the author's introduction to this part. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين آمين So Qadi Ayad, he says, may Allah have mercy on him. May we benefit from his knowledge in this world in the next introduction. Allah Ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Muhammad is only a messenger and messengers have passed away before him. Why if he should die or be killed? And then Allah Ta'ala also says in the Qur'an, the Messiah, son of Mary, is only a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him and his mother was a truthful woman. They used to eat food. Allah Ta'ala also says, we only sent messengers before who ate food and walked in the markets. And Allah Ta'ala also says, Say, I am a mortal like you to whom revelation has been given. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the prophets of mankind were sent to mankind. If it had not been for that, people would not have been able to have met them face to face, to have accepted them, to have accepted from them and spoken with them. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, if we made him an angel, we would still have made him a man. So the humanity of the prophets, plural, السلام, is an essential part of our belief. In other words, it is because the prophets have been sent to us, the people before us, that is, uh, that in their, you know, they were human beings, of course, that they could have, in, they interacted with people. That is to say, if that had happened, the angel would have been taken the form of a man to whom they could speak, since they would not be able to face an angel and speak with it if they saw him in its true form. Because the, the, the true manifestation of an angel is this enormous being. It's, it would be too much for us to handle. Allah Ta'ala also says in the Quran, say if there had been angels on the, on the earth walking at peace, we would have sent down upon them an angel as a messenger from heaven. This is to say it is not possible in the sunnah of Allah to send an angel except to one who is the same as it or to one whom Allah Ta'ala gives a special gift chooses and makes strong enough to be able to face it, such as the prophets and the messengers. The prophets and messengers, alayhi wasalam, are intermediaries between Allah and his creation. They convey his commands and prohibitions, his warnings and threat to his creatures, and they equate them with things they did not know regarding his command, creation, majesty, power, and his malakut. Their outward form, bodies, and structure are characterized by the qualities of men, as far as non-essential matters such as illness, death, and passing away are concerned, and they have human traits. So they're humans, they have human traits, the MBA are humans. But their souls and the inward parts have the highest possible human qualities associated with the highest assembly, which are similar to angelic attributes, free of any possibility of alteration or evil. Generally speaking, the incapacity and weakness connected with being human cannot be associated with them. 
If their inward parts had been human in the same way as their outward, they would not have been able to receive revelation from the angels, see them, mix and sit with them in the way other mortars, mortals are unable to do. Okay, so outwardly they are humans, but inwardly they are, they are humans as well, but they are of a high quality, the highest quality. And that's why this section of the book he's saying is so important. If their bodies and outward parts had been marked by angelic attributes, as opposed to human attributes, the mortals to whom they were sent would not have been able to speak to them as Allah has already said. Thus, they have the aspect of men as far as their bodies and outward parts are concerned, and that of angels in respect of their souls and their inward parts. It is in this way that the Prophet wasallam said, if I had taken a close friend from my community, I would have taken Abu Bakr as a friend, but it is the brotherhood of Islam. Rather, your companion is the close friend of the merciful, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, my eyes sleep and my heart does not sleep. So the Prophet wasallam did not sleep the way that we sleep. If you saw him sleeping, you would have said, oh, he's sleeping. But he is not sleeping because he is, as he said, he is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even in his sleep form, it's different than our form. The Prophet ﷺ also said, I am not made the same as you, but my Lord gives me food and makes me drink. Their inward parts are disconnected from evil and free from imperfection and weakness. This summary will certainly not be enough for all those who are concerned with the subject. Most people will require further explanation and detail, and this will come in the following two chapters. With the help of Allah, He is enough for me and the best of guardians. Okay, so right off the bat, with just with this very small introduction, I hope we can see what he's driving at, which is that the Prophet is not like us. He's like us, but he's not like us. Right? He's like us, and then he's a human being, and you know, uh, he had a, has a life, and uh, he gets tired, he sleeps, he, he gets sick, and so on and so forth. But on the inside, the inward quality, he's completely different than us. And that's why this book has been written and why it's so important for us because it teaches us these, you know, the, it, teach, it teaches us who he was, والسلام, and therefore how to interact with him. Chapter 1, concerning matters of the deen and the prophets being protected from imperfection. We are on page 279. Preface, know that Unexpected events and afflictions to which a person is subject can occur to the body or senses, either without intention and choice, as in the case of illness and disease, or by intention and choice. All these things can actually be categorized as actions. However, the sheikhs have classified them into three types, belief with the heart, statement on the tongue, and actions by the limbs. All men have afflictions and changes happen to them both by choice and without it, in each of these categories. Although the Prophet ﷺ was a man, and therefore whatever is permitted to happen to people in general could in theory happen to him, definite proofs have been established and it is agreed by consensus that such things did not happen to him and he was free from many of the afflictions which occur with or without choice as we will make clear to you in the exposition of which follows. So, Whenever I talk about the prophets in general, and for those of you who have been around me for some time, you know that I always mention that the MBA, the prophets are not, a, they're not heroes. When we talk about heroes, and we talk about heroic figures in the past or heroic figures now, we usually talk about the hero's journey, and we talk about how people overcome a, a challenge that they have and um, they overcome maybe doubt. Uh, maybe somebody was a sinner and has come back to the faith, or maybe somebody was a disbeliever and has come back to faith, something like that. The MBA, the prophets are not like that. They are beyond that. They, they are archetypes. They are not heroes. They are exemplars. They are examples that we follow. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنٌ you know, indeed in the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for you is a perfect example. So the hero, I am moved by the hero's story. And I pray that I can be a hero too. But the prophets, alayhim salam, and specifically Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we follow him in everything, 
right? So the hero is more like it's an, an emotional thing. You can't follow the hero, uh, the hero's specific story because he's a person just like you. And they, that journey is specific to that person. But the Prophet, والسلام, yeah, we pray the way he prays. We make wudu the way he makes wudu. Um, uh, we walk into the mosque with this foot and we say this dua. So all of the things that he did, we do. We, re we reenact that all the time because he is, an, he is an example for us. What makes him that example is exactly what we're talking about here, is that he is infallible. He has been protected from all of the shortcomings that can befall a human being. So I want you to keep that in mind and I'll keep coming back to that because this is very, 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 very important for us uh, as Muslims to learn. Okay, section one. Section one is actually very, very long, so we're not we're not going to get through all of it. Um, uh, we're going to get through maybe about half of it. But, you know, since we started this long journey together, I have not really been looking at pace. Um, but from the pace point of view, mashallah, you know, we're on page 279. And I think the book that we have before us, it goes to 446. So... I suspect four to five more months and we'll finish the book. But it's not about finishing. It's about, you know, making the, the meaning stick. So I'm not really looking about speed. We're just, uh, as you've noticed, I'm just, you know, we, we get on here. We have a time, but uh, I try to do as much as I think is tolerable for a class. Okay, section one concerning the belief of the Prophet's heart, salam, from the moment of his prophethood. Know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Tawheed, his knowledge of Allah and the attributes of Allah, his belief in Allah, and what was revealed to him is based on the greatest possible gnosis. Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, in the English language or in the European language, is what we call in Arabic al-ma'rifa. It's, it's inner knowledge. So I'm giving you right now outer knowledge. You know, when I sit with you and I teach and we read a book, this is outward knowledge. Hopefully, for all of us, myself included, it's, it stimulates the inner knowledge, a deep knowledge. So when, when um, knowledge is a huge topic in the Islamic sciences, and most of the uh, usul ulama, the ulama that write about usul al-fiqh and the philosophers, you know, they have uh, pages and pages and pages about the definition of knowledge and our epistemology and what is the intellect and all that. I mean, this is not the place, not, uh, nor the time, nor place to talk about that. But it's a huge topic that the ulama were obsessed with understanding knowledge. And because it's a huge topic for us, because the first verses revealed to the Prophet were Iqra, Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Islam has an insatiable desire and almost obsession with knowledge. You know, we, 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 our ancestors were obsessed with learning things. So there are different names given to the different levels of knowledge. Here, the author is talking about the highest, the deepest, the most intense type of knowledge gnosis so he the, the prophet وسلم, knows these things about allah through gnosis uh, going back to the text clear knowledge and certainty it is free of ignorance doubt or suspicion so there is no doubt in the prophet's knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no doubt in the prophet وسلم's conviction or faith again he can't be a prophet if he has doubt and conviction i can be a hero and have doubt and conviction and overcome that doubt. Not mention, that's fine. But not the MBA. The reason I'm emphasizing this is because of the, in the Judeo-Christian world. Uh, and many of our understandings of the prophets. If we live in the West long enough. Sometimes it's we, we assume certain things that are, that are not come from the Islamic tradition. If you read about some of the MBA. In the uh, in the Hebrew Bible and in the in the Gospels, uh, they are not infallible, which is hugely highly problematic. Uh, you know, and that's a huge critique that we have towards their treatment of these MBA. The Prophet Asasim is protected in respect of these things from everything incompatible with gnosis and certainty. The Muslims have a general consensus regarding this. There's no, what I'm telling you, there's no difference of opinion between any Muslim, Sunni, Shia, East, West, North, South, whatever. Clear proofs indicate that it would not be sound to impute to him anything other than the beliefs of all of the prophets. Ibrahim's words in the Quran are, yes, but so that my heart will be at peace. 
with Qala Ibrahim, Rabbi Arini Kaifa Tuhi al Mauta. When Abraham says to Allah, Show me how you give life to death. Awalam Tukmin, Allah says, Don't you believe? He says, Bella, Walakin, Liatma inna Qabi. No, I believe, yes, but that my heart will be at peace. This does not contradict this, since Ibrahim السلام, did not doubt that Allah, what Allah had told him about being, uh, bringing the dead to life. He wanted to put his heart at peace and to be free from any contentiousness by actually seeing the dead brought to life. Uh, he first acquired indirect knowledge of its occurrence, and then subsequently he desired knowledge by direct witnessing. By the way, since we're talking about Ibrahim السلام, it would be it's not uncommon for people within Islam who are not, you know, well trained to to because they don't know this, they will look at the verses when Ibrahim alayhi salam was debating with his people and saying, Oh, I worship the stars alone, then the moon, oh, and then the sun. They will say that he was actually looking and searching for God, and then God revealed himself. Ahasha, no, he was this was a rhetoric tool that he was trying to show them how um uh, how deficient their learning was. Why? How do I know that that's an in incorrect interpretation, the first thing that I said? Because of this point here. It's impossible for a prophet to have doubt or lack of conviction in their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A second possibility is that the pro is that Prophet Ibrahim السلام, wanted to learn about his station with his Lord and know whether this supplication asking his Lord for his favor would be answered. Then Allah ta'ala says, do you not believe? That is, that your station with me and your close friendship and your being chosen are confirmed. A third possibility is that he is asking for increase in certainty and peace of mind, even though he did not doubt in the first instance. Knowledge and speculative knowledges in particular can vary in strength. And whereas it is impossible for doubt to occur where necessary knowledges are concerned, it is permissible in speculative ones. <laughs> he wanted to move from speculation and report and report to something witnessing it to rise from the knowledge of certainty to the vision of certainty. A report is not the same as eyewitnessing. This is why Sahil ibn Abdullah at Tustari, rahimahullah, one of the great you know, Sufi figures of Islam said, he asked for the cover to be lifted from his eyes so that he could be increased in his firm state by the light of certainty. A fourth possibility is that he used as, a, uh, he, he used as an argument against the idolaters the fact that their Lord brings life and brings death and makes die and, and, and makes brings to life and makes die. He sought his favor from his Lord in order to confirm his argument by eyewitnessing. A fifth possibility, as someone said, is that Ibrahim السلام, is making a request using adab, etiquette, and that what is really implied is give me the power to bring the dead to life, implying so that my heart will be at rest from this desire. And a sixth possibility is that he saw in himself doubt and what could be doubted, but he was answered and he was increased in nearness. Our Prophet ﷺ said, we are more likely to doubt than Ibrahim ﷺ. The Prophet's statement negates the possibility of any doubt on Ibrahim's part. It eliminates any negative thought that the companions might have had about Ibrahim ﷺ, i.e. the meaning is we are certain of the rising and that Allah Ta'ala will bring the dead to life. If Ibrahim had doubted, he would have been more likely to doubt than him. The Prophet said this, والسلام, either by way of adab, or because the Prophet meant we, meaning his community, who were of course subject to doubt, or by way of humility and, com and compassion, if the story of Ibrahim والسلام, is taken to apply to the experience of his state or to his increase in certainty. If in this context, you ask about the meaning of Allah's words, quote, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who recite the book before you. Then beware. May Allah Ta'ala make your heart firm. Beware of letting anything that certain commentators have mentioned from Ibn Abbas or anyone else cause you to think anything which suggests doubt on the part of the Prophet concerning what was revealed to him. Even if his doing this would be part of humanness, this is not permissible for him at all. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet ﷺ did not doubt nor question. Something similar comes to us from Ibn Jubayr and Al Hassan al Basri. Qatada said that the Prophet ﷺ said, I do not doubt and do not question. 
there is also some disagreement about what this verse means. It is said that what is meant is, O Muhammad, say to the doubters, if you are in doubt, then ask the people that have the book before you. Some commentators have said that the other parts of the surah indicate this interpretation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, quote, say, O people, if you are in doubt about my deen. It is said here that the, the it is said that here the Arabs and people other than the Prophet والسلام, are meant in the same way that Allah's words, if you associate your actions, will fail. The Prophet is being addressed, but the import is intended for others. This is similar to the quote in the Quran, do not be in doubt about what these men worship. There are many other similar instances. The point is, is that he is lifting us for us some verses from the Quran that could lead somebody to falsely conclude that the Prophet ﷺ had doubt. And now he's showing us why that is not possible and that there are other interpretations of these verses. Why are there other interpretations of these verses? Because there's this one core principle that the Prophet cannot have any doubt ﷺ. That's the key. So therefore, anything that you read in Islamic literature, in Islamic intellectual history, that would make you think that the Prophet ﷺ faltered, flagged, failed, doubted, then you know that it's not true. Or it's been misinterpreted and then there's another interpretation. Why? Because there's a first principle here that there can be no doubt for Rasulullah ﷺ or any of the Anbiya. That's the point of what he's saying. I hope everyone is still with me and I'm not losing anyone. Bakr ibn al-Ala said, do not, don't you see that Allah Ta'ala says, do not be among those who deny the signs of Allah. It is the Prophet who is being denied in what he is calling to. So how can he be amongst those who deny Allah? This shows that someone else is meant. It is like Allah Ta'ala's words, the merciful one, the merciful, ask one who is informed about him. The one being commanded here is not the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet, wasalam, rather, is the one who is informed and uh, questioned. He is not the asker. Such doubt is what led to some other people besides the Prophet ﷺ being commanded to ask those who recite the book regarding what Allah Ta'ala has related about the history of past nations but not however about the Prophet what the Prophet ﷺ called to regarding Tawheed and the Sharia. This is like Allah Ta'ala's words ask about those we sent of our messengers before you. The idolaters are meant while the words are directed to the Prophet ﷺ. It is also said that this verse means, ask us about those we sent before you. Then Allah Ta'ala continues with the question, have we appointed apart from the merciful any deities to be worshipped in order to negate this, that suggestion? It is said that the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to ask the other prophets this question during the night journey. He is certain, his, his, his certainty was too strong to need to ask the question. It is related that he said, I do not ask, I have enough. Ibn Zayd related that. It is said that this verse means ask the nations to whom we sent prophets if their prophets had come to them without tawheed. This is what Mujahid, al suddi al dahak and Al-Qatada said it meant. The sum of this, and this is he's kind of concluding what we've just been talking about. The sum of this is that the Prophet ﷺ is informing us about what the messengers were sent with. Allah Ta'ala did not give permission to anyone to worship other than him. This refutes the Arab idolaters when they said, we worship them to come near Allah Ta'ala in proximity, referring to the idols. A similar use of language is used in the Qur'an when Allah Ta'ala says, those who are given the book now that it was sent down from your Lord with the truth, so on no account be amongst the doubters. That is concerning their knowledge that you are intended the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if they did not affirm that. This does not mean that the Prophet ﷺ was entertaining doubts about what was mentioned at the beginning of the verse. It is like what was already mentioned, that is, O Muhammad, say to those who doubt, do not be amongst the doubters. This is shown by Allah Ta'ala's words at the beginning of the verse, should I seek some other judge than Allah, in which the Prophet ﷺ is clearly addressing others. It is said that this verse, which is chapter 10, verse 94, is in fact an affirm affirmation, as in Allah Ta'ala's words, did you say to people, take me and my mother as gods apart from Allah? Allah knows very well that Isa did not say that. 
So when Allah Ta'ala addresses Isa, he says, you know, did you tell people to follow, meaning me, Christ, and my mother, Mary, other, uh, not Allah? And then Isa says, of course I didn't say that. So <clears throat> obviously Allah Ta'ala is not accusing Isa of saying it's like a rhetorical structure in the Quran to show us the misguidance of the people that claim they follow Christ, alayhi salam. It is said that the meaning of this verse is you are not in doubt, so ask and you will be increased in your peace of mind and will have greater knowledge and certainty. It is said that the meaning is if you are in doubt about what we have honored and preferred you with, then ask them about your description in the previous books and to the extent of your virtues recorded in them. It is related from Abu Ubaidah at Tamimi that the meaning is if you have misgivings from other people regarding the revelation. You may ask about the meaning of Allah Ta'ala's words, quote, until when the messengers despaired and thought that they had been deceived regarding Allah's promise and victory. Using the words, Kuddibu. We say that the correct meaning is what our mother Lady Aisha alayhi salam said. We seek refuge with Allah from the messengers thinking such a thing about their Lord. It means, according to most commentators, that when the messengers despaired, they thought that those of their followers who had been promised victory had rejected them. So not that they despaired in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but were concerned about their community. So all of these verses could be misinterpreted for you to say that the prophets alayhim as -salam, or Rasulullah sallallahu has some kind of doubt. <clears throat> it is said by Ibn, uh, it is said by Ibn al Abbas and al Nakhai, Ibn Jubair and others, that the word thought in the verse refers to the followers and the communities of the prophets and messengers, not the prophets and messengers themselves, alayhim as -salam. That meaning is related by Mujahid who reads it as kathabu, they lied. As you know, there are different recitations in the Quran. But do not preoccupy yourself with a rare commentary which does not benefit the station of the ulama, let alone the prophets, alayhim as -salam. It is like what is related in the hadiths and seerah about what happened at the beginning of the revelation when the Prophet ﷺ said to Lady Khadija salam, I am afraid for myself. It does not mean that he doubted what Allah Ta'ala had brought him after he saw the angel. It meant that he feared that his strength might not be enough to bear the encounter with the angel with the result that his heart might burst and he would die. So there are a lot of miscon misconceptions that come from the, very be the, the early part of the revelation you know, some people will even say, oh, the Prophet ﷺ was depressed and he was going to throw himself off of a mountain. I mean, all these crazy type of, uh, you know, statements. So he's picking up one of them, you know, when he goes to Lady Khadija, alayhi salam, after the encounter with Jibreel, and he says, I'm, I'm afraid for myself, not afraid. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that, you know, as he's saying, it doesn't mean that he's doubtful or he's like scared when I... You know, if I saw something scary, he's saying, I'm scared, I'm not, you know, that I'm going to die because the encounter was so intense. It has a completely different meaning. Why? Because the Prophet, Ali Sassam, cannot have any doubt. That's the whole point. He said this according to, uh, to what is in the seerah, uh, after, uh, either after he met the angel or before he met him when Allah Ta'ala uh, was uh, informing him of his prophethood by means of, of the first extraordinary experiences which happened to him when the stones and trees greeted him and the prophetic dreams and good news began. So the, the, the stones and the tr trees greeting the Prophet ﷺ and the dreams and everything happening in, in what he saw in the dream happened before the encounter with Jibreel uh, in, in the cave. As has been related in one of the paths of transmission, the first thing to happen to him was a dream. Then he was shown a similar thing in the waking state that was to make it easier for him so that the prophethood would not come suddenly and directly upon him making his human frame unable to bear it on its first appearance. In the Sahih, we find from Lady Aisha alayhi salam, that she said the first intimation that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi had revelation of was true dreams. She said, then he was made to love retreat until the truth came to him when he was in the cave of Hira. Ibn Abbas and there are also hadith, I don't think he's going to mention it here, but there are other hadith that indicate that one of the times in which the Prophet Sassam's chest was opened and his heart was cleansed was before the revelation. And one of the reasons this happens um, 
there are three like agreed upon times in the seerah that this happens when the prophet was a child uh the night of the revelation and the night of the isra and the ma'raj but when you read it that there are some ulama who have gathered these narrations there are other narrations that would make the number six or seven times why do why do we have these why was the prophet chest you know split open and his heart cleansed etc is for what he's saying here to make the human frame of the prophet be able to withstand this physical encounter with gabriel the revelation and then the uh, ascension to the heavens <clears throat> Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet remained in Mecca for 15 years, hearing a voice and then seeing a light and nothing else for seven years. Then he received revelation for eight years. Ibn Ishaq related that one of the Salaf said that the Prophet mentioned his experience in the cave of Hira and said, he came to me when I was asleep and he said, recite, Iqra. And I said, what should I recite? There is a similar hadith from Lady Aisha السلام, which states that Jibreel seized him and recited the surah to him, recite in the name of your Iqra bismi rabbika ladifa. Then he said, he left me and I woke up and it was as if something had been taken from my heart. Now nothing was more hateful to me than a poet or someone possessed. I said, Quraysh will never say this of me. I shall go to the top of a mountain and throw myself off and kill myself. While I was intending to do that, I heard a voice calling from heaven, saying, O oh Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah, and I am Jibreel. I looked up, and there was Jibreel in the form of a man. If if the, if the Qadi Ayat doesn't address this narration, I will. Let me just read a couple more paragraphs, and then we'll, I'll, I'm not going to leave it, inshallah. It is clear uh, from this that what the Prophet ﷺ said and what he intended to do occurred before he met Jibreel and before Allah Ta'ala had informed him of his prophethood, his being made known and being chosen for the message. This is similar to the hadith of Amr ibn Shurhabil to which the Prophet ﷺ is reported as saying to Lady Khadija salam, since I have been retreat, in retreat, I have heard a voice and I fear by Allah that this is due to some foolish, foolishness on my part. Okay, I don't know if he's going to address. I mean, I have a feeling he is going to address it, but because this chapter section is so long. In Bukhari, I can't remember who the narrator is, but in Bukhari on this story, this part is not part of the hadith of the initial revelation, but rather the narrator says wabala ghana, and it has come to us, and then he 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 states the part about. The Prophet was wanted to throw himself from the mountain. That so that part is not part of the hadith. And we heard, meaning I'm just documenting, you know, things that are out there, but but that does not coincide or does not jive with what we're talking about. So that can't have that that either that portion of the story is completely rejected because it's not sound, or it has another tafsir. It means something else. Um, so just in case Qadi Ayat doesn't, doesn't mention it, I wanted to mention that. Okay, I'm going to read a couple more paragraphs and then we'll, 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 we'll pause. Uh, Hamad ibn uh, Salama said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, I heard a voice and I see a light and I fear that there is some madness in me. According to this, if it is true that he said the most hateful things to me is a poet or one possessed or phrases which imply doubt in the truth of what he saw, all of that was at the beginning of his affair before the angel met him and informed and informed him from Allah Ta'ala that he was the messenger, والسلام, But how can it be so when some of these things have not come by sound paths of transmission, meaning the chain of transmission is not strong? As for, uh, as for after Allah Ta'ala had informed him and after he had met the angel, doubt is not valid in that case, for it is not permissible for him to doubt what he received. Ibn Ishaq related that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to have a talisman against the evil eye before the revelation descended on him. After the Quran had descended on him, he was afflicted with something of the evil eye. Khadija asked him, Alayhi Salam, shall I send someone to you to make a talisman for you? And he replied, no, not now. 
There's also the hadith where Lady Khadija salam, experimented regarding the matter of Jibreel by uncovering her head. She did that to confirm the soundness of the Prophet of the, of the Messenger of Allah salam, and of what the angel brought and to remove her own doubts, not for the sake of the Prophet salam, and so that she would be informed about his state. It has come in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Yahya ibn Urwa from Hisham ibn Urwa from his father from Lady Aisha alayhi salam that Waraqa commanded Khadija alayhi salam to test the matter in that way. In the hadith of Ismail ibn Abi Hakim, Khadija said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa son of my uncle, will you tell me when your companion comes to you? He replied, yes. When Jibreel came, he told her. She said to him, sit by my side. At the end of the hadith, she said, it is not a shaitan, it is an angel, son of my uncle, so be firm and rejoice. She believed him. This indicates that she sought to verify it for herself by what she did and to demonstrate her belief it was not done for the sake of of the Prophet So he's, he's, he's undoing now a lot of the narrations that would make you falsely conclude that the Prophet had doubt. Um, okay. Mamar ibn Rashid al-Yamani spoke about the gap in the revelation because after the initial revelation there was a gap of time. Uh, we have heard that the Prophet ﷺ was so sad. You see, we have heard. We have heard. This is not the, the, the phraseology that is used to narrate a sound tradition. We have heard that the Prophet ﷺ was so sad that when he went, he went out at times to throw himself off of a mountain. Mamar did not give an isnad, did not give a chain of transmission or mention the line of transmission for what he said. It could only be possible it, only could, it, it could only possibly be applied to the Prophet ﷺ at the very beginning of his affair or because of the denial of his, of his message by those to whom he conveyed it. It is as Allah Ta'ala says, perhaps you will, you will consume yourself with grief over them if they do not believe in their words. Okay, so he did address it. So that portion of the story, he's saying it's one of two interpretations. Either that's something that happened before he was commissioned as a prophet but I reject that interpretation because the Prophet ﷺ is infallible and is protected from birth, not just when he is commissioned as a prophet. And Or he says it means something else that he's concerned about, about his community. But the most important thing from our intellectual framework is that there's no chain of transmission. So if there's no chain of transmission, it doesn't mean anything. There's no weight, no, no evidentiary weight can be given to that statement. Okay, this is a good place for, for us to pause. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam wa sallallahum ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Insha'Allah, because Eid is next weekend, we will not have class next weekend, but I'll be, insha'Allah, back. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing Jum'ah next Friday, and then, and then we'll have the Ashura program and you, you, you'll have enough of me till you get fed up with me, inshallah. <clears throat> oh, Sister Zabruda says that they're leaving for Hajj on Monday, so you, you make dua for us. We'll make dua for you. No, 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 you are dua for, for us. us. <laughs> For seniors. Uh, Somebody is asking me about the issue of the satanic verses. So there are two ways. Well, what are the satanic verses? Uh, the satanic verses are when things got very bad in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ told some of the companions who were able to, to go to Abyssinia, to migrate to Abyssinia. So... Uh, many of the leading Sahaba who were able to physically, financially, they went to Africa. And then Surat al-Najm uh, was revealed. At the end of Surat al-Najm, uh, there's a sajda. And in the beginning of Surat al-Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, so Allah Ta'ala is talking about the false uh, the false gods. In the narration that supports the satanic verses, Iblis was at that gathering 
And when the Prophet ﷺ recited those verses, he responded, Iblis responded, Oh, You know, these are the great, the great cranes or the great things. Not that the Prophet ﷺ said that, okay? And because at the end of the, the verse, there's a sajda, everybody made sajda, even the disbelievers. So the rumor started and reached Abyssinia that the conflict is over and all of Mecca has followed the Prophet ﷺ and there's been a compromise. So they started to come back. And when they started to come back to Mecca and they realized that that wasn't the case, they returned. So that's why we refer to it in the Sira as the first Hijra to Abyssinia and the second Hijra to Abyssinia. That's, you know, and maybe I didn't do a very eloquent job, but that's the, the basic story. There are two ways to deal with the story. And I have two sets of teachers who, who dealt with it. And, and I, they're always there. I, I, I mentioned this to one of my teachers not too long ago, he was very upset because I mentioned what another teacher was saying. So the two ways of dealing with it is that the chains of transmission of the um, story is very spurious and dubious. Like the, the thing that we just mentioned about throwing himself off of the mountain. So if that's the case, then it's just rejected because there's no, it's, there's no basis for it. And... Um, you know, we're not going to build our deen on, uh, on, with, regarding such an important issue if there's no chain of transmission or the chain of transmission is so weak and, and defective that we can't use it. Many, many ulama of hadith throughout Islamic history have dealt with that story uh, that way. That's one way of dealing with it. The other way of dealing with it, uh, which was the way actually I was taught, is that this teaches us a very important lesson in, in regards to our interpretive methodology, which is that which is protected is the physical form of the Prophet ﷺ and not his speech, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning that if the Prophet ﷺ came to you in a dream, that's the Prophet because he said, man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani. Whoever sees me in their dream state has seen me. That the, the, the Satan doesn't take my form. But he didn't say that his speech was protected. Meaning if you dreamt of the Prophet ﷺ and then he told you something, whatever he told you in the dream has to be placed in the balance of the Sharia. What's the proof of this, this story? That the Prophet ﷺ did not praise the false gods. It was Iblis who said that. The Prophet ﷺ was receiving revelation and then as it was coming to him, he was... You know, when Najmi Ida Hawa, may Allah Sahibukum, may Hawa, or may Untiko Anil Hawa, you know, he was re he's reciting the verses. It was Iblis somewhere in the gathering, you know, taking the form of a person or an old person, and then him yelling out. So, again, what the Prophet says during his lifetime and in the in a dream state has to be placed in the balance of the Sharia. Now, I can see why the first group doesn't like that interpretation because. And it's too 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 involved and too complicated and convoluted. I understand the the value of the second um, uh, the second interpretation, but the sounder way from the the way that our evidence is constructed in, from our primary sources is that there nobody denies uh, that the the tra chain of transmission is weak. It's just a weak transmission, and and it's too spurious and dubious for us to even pay attention to it. I hope that answered the question. I apologize if it was a little too clunky. <clears throat> um, as you know, these uh, today was the beginning of, of the month of Dhul Hijjah. So these days, you know, from now until Eid Day, these are great days, important days, beautiful days. Um, th there are days of fasting, there are days of charity, there are days of prayer and uh, recitation of the Qur'an and prayers on the Prophet ﷺ. You know, I know that we're all busy and we got things to do, but this is a great opportunity for us to, you know, take some extra time and do some devotional work because these are the best days of the year. And the nights of Ramadan, you know, the last 10 nights of the Ramadan are the best nights of the year. So these are the best day, and Allah Ta'ala swears by these days. Wal Fajr, Wal Ayal, and Ash, Wal Shafi, Wal Wat. You know, these are the days <coughs> that are sworn by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, you know, next Friday we'll talk about that, and hopefully, if you guys are able to, next Saturday we'll, we'll, we, we usually fast as a community because it's the day of Arafah, and uh, we'll break our fast together. 
we'll have a um, we'll have a function at the mosque on Saturday evening, inshallah. But I just wanted to highlight that and uh, to remind myself and to remind you to make the most of these days with some extra devotional work, whatever is within your capacity, inshallah. Uh, does anyone have any last minute questions or anything? You can fast during the week. These are also days of fasting. Um, if you can fast, then great. If you can only fast a little bit, make sure that you fast uh, the day of Arafah, which is next Saturday, uh, because that's there's a special reward, which we'll talk about when we get there uh, specifically on that day. Okay, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Um, uh, some of us are going to Hajj, so we make dua that they go, uh, our brothers and sisters go to Hajj safely and come back safely. And for those that are going to Hajj, please remember us and please give our salams to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi. اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون سيوصون إن شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته